Okay, I think it's uh, time to start. So, uh, so this talk is on a project that uh, I've been working on with Jesse Lures, um, and it's for a mop for Perl 5. So it's, uh, it's sort of grown out of the Moose project, but it's got a, sort of a number of differences um, with Moose, and we'll go over those in this talk. So first thing I wanted to do actually was, um, there's a couple of Larry quotes that I've been kicking around in a couple of different talks, um, sort of three of my favorites. Um, and so what I did is I actually, uh, I pulled Larry aside yesterday and um, I sort of asked him about them. First to make sure he actually said them, um, because I don't want to quote him when he, uh, he didn't actually say it. Um, but also to get his, his point of view on some of these quotes, because some of these quotes are actually good 10, 15 years old. Um, so I was sort of wanted to get his view on uh, these things in sort of the new modern uh, context. Um, so this is the first one. Um, so he said this, uh, I believe he thought it was sometime around the beginning of Perl 5, so when it was first being designed. Um, and he actually, he told me, it's sort of an, he said an interesting thing that I'd never really actually given too much thought to, um, but as soon as he said it, it made sense. Um, adding the sigils to variables uh, was a conscious decision to allow or to prevent uh, future conflict with built-ins. Okay, so if all your variables are prefixed by a sigil, then they're never going to conflict with a built-in word. Therefore, you can continue to extend the language built-ins with, uh, with, uh, without conflicting with variables. So I thought that was a very interesting thing, sort of showing that Perl from the very beginning was thought to be a very, was meant to be a very flexible and evol evolvable language. This is the second quote. Um, this actually spawned a little discussion, but I think the, the, the important thing of it is that if you parse this sentence, there's only one community in this, okay? There's no distinction between Perl 5 and Perl 6. We're all in the same, uh, we're all in the same boat, as it were. Um, and then lastly, uh, this one. So this, this was, uh, when I asked Larry about this, he talked about how in Perl 4 there was separate distributions. There was Aura Perl, Psi Perl, and a bunch of sort of other different things. And he noticed that there was sort of a splintering um, of the community, or at least a potential for a splintering of the community. Um, and so by building a module system, he would sort of allow everybody to sort of stay in, around one core, but extend the community and extend the language through modules. Um, so again, sort of a conscious decision on his part, almost a social decision made at, at a language level. Um, and I also think, I'd also like to say that I think this statement is proved true by conferences like this, all the workshops, the conferences, the Perl mongers groups. Um, I think we're all, we've all gathered around this sort of central core of Perl, be it Perl 5, Perl 6, whatever, and we're all sort of gathered around it. Um, and so I think, I think Larry's, uh, Larry's successful in this one. So. <coughs> This, uh, this project was sort of born out of a talk that Jesse Vincent gave, um, and he gave it at, uh, I think, last summer at YAPSI NA, YAPSI EU, OSCON, and YAPSI Asia. So he basically did sort of a world tour, and this, uh, this talk sort of was Jesse's vision for uh, the future of the Pearl 5 core. So he was the pump king at the time, he since handed the reins to Ricardo Cygnus, who is still mostly keeping in, 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 uh, in the spirit of this talk um, as well. So, but a couple of things that Jesse mentioned there sort of stuck out to me in particular. Um, and the first was that he had an idea of sort of reducing the Perl core, okay? Um, and in order to do that, the idea was to take things that were maybe not necessary. So Perl is really a Unix toolkit plus a language, okay? Which is great if you're on Unix, but really, not terribly interesting if you're on Windows or potentially if you're on a, you know, we can't, yes, well, no, you can run on an Android. You can run Perl on an Android. So things like that become less relevant as you move to different platforms. Um, so the idea was to start taking some of those core elements that really were operating system specific and move them into modules, okay? Now, the wavy arrow is because there's a lot of hand waving, okay, in, in that statement. Nobody's quite sure exactly how we can do that. Can we move formats? Uh, can we move those into a module? Can we move all the Unix uh, uh, extensions into a module, et cetera, et cetera? But the idea was that by creating a simpler language, we actually create a more evolvable language, okay? And equally as important, we also create a more maintainable language, 
Um, I, think, I think we counted three P5P hackers who can basically hack the entire core. Um, you have a number of people who can act, hack different parts of it, but you know, that's, that's a small subset. I mean, it's three out of how many human beings are on the planet right now? Six million or something like that, billion? So, you know, by creating a simpler language, we make it more approachable and more maintainable. And of course, we also make it more hackable, which is what we like. Um, we like being able to play with our, our toys. That's the Pearl community. Um, so, the one question that this might raise for some people is, does this mean that we're going to be losing anything in Perl? And my response to that is basically, hell no. We've got CPAN for that, okay? And that's sort of the core idea of, you reduce the core, you move it into modules, and you can begin to get a, um, actually, Larry said something interesting in regards to this quote. He actually said that, uh, so the, the whole breaking up the Aura Pearl and the Sys Pearl, stuff like that, by allowing people to expand more in the modules, he actually allowed the community to be lexically scoped. So we as a community could choose what we wanted to extend with, what, what idioms we wanted to work with, what, what dialect of Pearl we wanted to talk. Um, so, dude, sorry, gotta go back to the slides. So therefore, a simpler language is a more hackable language, more lexically scoped, if you will. Um, so that, that I, I, th I think that what Jesse, I think Jesse's idea is a good one. And so, in response to the idea of making a language simpler, um, I have a proposal to add a bunch of new complexity to it. So, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, uh, first let's go over MOP. How many of you here are familiar with the idea of MOPs? Okay, good amount of people, so we'll, we'll, we won't spend too long on this. Um, so a, a MOP is a meta object protocol, okay? And what it is, it's basically an API for these things, okay? And I want you to note the uppercase in each of these names, that's an important thing. Because the class of class is class. And if you don't have upper and lower case in that statement, it's kind of difficult to parse. So uh, just as you would build an abstraction around sockets or, or a database or something like that, uh, a MOP is an abstraction around these four concepts. Um, and when my mother asked me, what is that that you do all day at work? <laughs> this is actually what I tell her. Mostly to kind of avoid the discussion, but <laughs> it's, it's not really that untrue. It's an abstraction, which is the MOP, of a, system of, of, a, of a system of abstractions, which are classes, methods, attributes, so on. And we use it to build abstractions, which are your classes, okay? So, I'm not lying to my mother, at least. <laughs> so. Um, so, anyway, so uh, that's a, the, sort of the core idea of a mop, okay? Um, and this actually, we've already had a mop, okay? This is a mop for all intents and purposes. This, this is a slightly awkward syntax, um, but it is feature complete. You can use this to build a full object system on top of Perl. That's what we did with Moose, okay? So all the possibilities and all the features and all the flexibility is inherently there already in Perl. We did, though, however, build Moose, um, and this is a diagram to represent the, uh, the, uh, the mop itself. Um, this is basically a picture of what class mop, which is the underlying technology that Moose runs on, what it looks like. So if you see, uh, the, one of the important things is to, these, these dotted lines mean instance of. So one of the important things here is, like I said, class is class class, lowercase class, uppercase class is an instance of uppercase class, okay? It's a bootstrap. Now, that may seem esoteric and silly and all that, but the reality is, is what this gives us is this gives us the ability to extend the mop and to extend Moose in particular and subsequently P5 mop with itself, okay? Which means you don't have to jump down into a lower level language um, or, or, or a lower level API. You can just use all the goodness that you get from the mop to extend the mop itself. Um, and the scheme guys love it, impresses, you know, list people and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so, but this is, this, is the, uh, this is very based on the Perl 6 object model, heavily based on the Perl 6 object model. Um, and this is currently what we have now. The P5 mop is actually a little simpler 
Um, we're sort of punting on the module and package for the time being, uh, mostly because we know we already have sufficient tools for them in the Moose ecosystem, so we can probably just sort of mer merge them together. We might bring the other ones back in. Uh, we're having a hackathon in Norway. We'll probably figure a lot of that stuff out. Um, so now let's get on to code. All right, so one of the things I want to point out is with the exception, with, with the few exceptions which I will point out, all of this code is actually runnable. You can go, you can check out the GitHub project, you can run the tests. It does require 5.14.2, is it Jesse, 5.14? 5.14, um, and that's because we're using a, a module called Devel Call Parser, which builds upon the keyword API which was recently added into Perl. Um, so as long as you're running the new one, and if you're all using Perl Brew, like you should be using, um, then you should be able to install it very quickly and very easily. Um, so this is, a, this is an example, this is a favorite example of mine. I've used it for years and years and years. Um, it's one of the first examples in the Moose cookbook, okay? And so this is just an example of a very simple class, okay? Um, the class keyword uh, is the class keyword. It's just that. Um, it will add uh, a base object to your inheritance tree if you don't specify um, a, a superclass. The next thing is the attributes. So if you're familiar with Moose, then you're familiar with has, and that's what you do, use to declare an attribute. The difference here is that we're actually creating variables. And we're creating very, this, is, this actually works very similarly to uh, my and our, okay? It creates what I call an instance scope rather than a, a package scope with R or a lexical scope with my. And what that means is that each one of these variables will be valid within your methods as, uh, as sort of as, uh, and they'll, be, they'll, they'll make sure to carry through the value of the current invocant, the instance that you're working on, okay? So essentially what that means is that every time you enter a method, we take what's in the instance and we stuff it into your lexical pad. And so therefore you have access to these lexical variables. And then lastly, of course, we have the method keyword, okay? So um, this, again, it's very simple. One thing I do like, and I didn't even realize this until I wrote it, was that you get that nice pattern matching, destructuring bind thing going on here that we all do very often, but you can use it to actually assign uh, your, your instance variables. So using these objects is exactly the same as using uh, any old Perl object. Um, classes, Classes themselves are first class things, meaning that that is not a, a, a weird condition of a string or anything like that. Anybody who's familiar with some sort of the weirdness of uh, 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 Perl classes knows that it's just a package name and that's what's being created. With the P5 mop, we actually do have real classes and real class objects, okay? So that would never be, a, never be confused with a string. New obviously, it's there. Uh, it comes from the base object, um, and it's applied to you and used to construct the instance. Um, pretty straightforward. We don't currently have any other way, or uh, have a way to provide an alternate constructor, um, but that's something we're looking into. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna hack on. Um, and then uh, name value pairs um, for the constructor. Now, this doesn't have to be this way either, um, but it's, it's sort of a nice default. It, um, uh, it makes things relatively easy. Um, there, there will be eventually ways to override this and to avoid it, but uh, honestly, this is a pretty good convention and it served us pretty well in the Moose community. So, taking this one step further, we have um, a subclass here. Again, building on the, again, building on the Moose examples. Um, extends point. So that's, uh, notice there's no quotes around the point. So like I said, this is not a string. This is a first class object that's, that, that exists in your namespace. Um, so extends the point, point 3D has Z. We call the super method right down there. Um, that'll make sure to call up the inheritance hierarchy. Um, and then we set Z to zero. One important thing to note is that right now the P5 mop classes are single inheritance. Um, we've talked about and fiddled with an idea of making the multiple inheritance, but honestly, single inheritance is significantly simpler, a lot easier to, to uh, optimize, um, 
and just overall easier to fit within your head from the meta layer. Um, it should be possible to do just about anything you wanted to do with multiple inheritance using roles. Um, and we found that to be pretty much true in the, in the last five, six years of Moose. Um, so, like I said, somebody will write a custom meta class and you'll be able to do multiple inheritance, but for now in the core, I think we're probably gonna stick with single inheritance. Um, okay, so uh, next example. Um, so, one thing I do wanna point out on this uh, is RO. That's actually not implemented yet. Um, we'll probably get to this in the, in the hackathon next week. But uh, the idea there is similar to Moose. It creates a read-only accessor for you, okay? Um, the next thing I wanna point out is how nice these little things are, the plus equals, all that. Um, and they're really nice because if you actually think about it, we saved four method calls by doing it this way. Um, if you had had a read-write accessor uh, set up for this balance, you would have made at least four method calls in order to do all this. You don't make these anymore. The P5 mop takes away the need for it. Not only does it make the nice syntax, but it reduces uh, internal method calls. And that's really because these, the balance, the, these instance arguments are truly private to your class. Um, they cannot leak out. You cannot say self, arrow, hash key, or anything like that. They are truly private to your class. Um, well, actually, no, you can kind of say that, but shh, you shouldn't look inside the instance. Don't look behind the curtain. Um, and, and actually, that instance may end up becoming a, a, a C type um, as well, in which case you wouldn't be able to look into it. But right now, the, the prototype uses a hash. Um, but so the point really here is that we're saving a lot of uh, overhead here. And I'd also like to point out, there's no self. We're not using self at all in here. Now, this is a simple contrived example for a slide, but there's no need for us to access the instance in here. We can access the, the instance variables themselves as we go. So, and then you probably also notice that the methods have parameters. So, no more unwrapping at underscore in there. You don't need it. Self is available to you within all the methods, um, and those, uh, all those parameters basically turn into internally an unpacking of at underscore. Okay, so now that said, it's a very simple parameter handling. We don't get into fancy stuff. Uh, some of the MooseX modules and some of the method signature modules, some of those modules take it sort of another step. Currently, we support um, uh, simple parameters, uh, slurpy parameters of, of, a, of a, a, hash or a hash or a uh, array at the end of a list. And do we have defaults in there yet? Default values are supported. But other than that, that's it. We're keeping it purposefully very, very, very simple. Um, so that we do not, uh, basically, so we don't want to run into a lot of bike shedding. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it's easier to just keep it straightforward and simple. So, uh, again, we're going to do a subclass. Um, one thing I want to point out in this uh, is that those were private. Balance was private in the previous class, which means the superclass doesn't get to see it, or I'm sorry, the subclass doesn't get to see it either. So we actually have to call the accessor. Um, now, thankfully, that makes sense in our API, so it's all well and good because you always want to be able to know what your balance is. Um, but you do have to call it in, in, in the subsequent classes, or in the subclasses. Um, and then again, I wanted to point out, so this, this is a bit where we deviate from Moose. Um, you have to pass that amount onward into the super call. This actually makes it act a lot more like the super the uppercase super pseudo package that we all know, love, and hate in uh, core Pro 5. Um, so you, but this also allows you to sort of munge arguments before you send them on to your super class. Um, okay. So uh, another thing that we recently added, it's actually still in a branch because Jesse and I can't decide on the actual underlying implementation details yet, um, but we'll fight it out in Norway, um, is roles. So how many of you are familiar with roles in Moose? How many of you are familiar with just roles as a concept if you're not familiar with them in Moose? Okay, good, good. All right, so I, I won't explain too many details here. Um, so a uh, couple things to point out. If you don't have a body on your method, it's required. Okay, this is actually pretty close to, I think, how, the pro, how, how they do it in Perl 6, although I believe they, do we have Perl 6ers here? Do they have a signature that they add to it or? I don't remember, okay. 
Um, so, uh, but by doing that, you're basically saying this role uh, or any class consuming this role is required to implement this method. And you do it simply by just not implementing the method. Um, and then in this case, uh, this is sort of a pattern of roles that's developed. Um, uh, this role is basically implemented, uh, uh, it's implemented by itself, basically. When the consuming class takes in this role and implements the equal to method, then boom, you get the not equal to for free. Um, so we're able to sort of do that. And that's actually, that's a pattern that's developed in Moose roles and actually Sean Moore is going to be giving a talk uh, later today about role usage patterns. Um, I highly recommend you go to it. It's very, very, very good. Um, so uh, here's a slightly more complex role example. Um, you'll notice that roles can themselves do other roles. So this role, uh, comparable, basically, you know, providing an interface for comparing um, a, uh, uh, something with something else, um, also does the equality role. And again, we see the required method um, in there. Roles can also just be interfaces. If you really love Java and you crave being able to write more Java in Perl, you can write a bunch of interfaces with absolutely no implementation. Um, but it's just as simple as, as doing this. And, and I joke. I love Java like everybody else. Um, <laughs> it's useful. You know, it's useful to be able to say, this thing is printable. And then everybody else can rely that if this thing is printable, there is an as string method. Now, whether that as string, as string method does something sensible, that's another story. But this is Perl. We can't guarantee those types of things. Um, we just have to trust in the sanity of our fellow authors. <laughs> Um, so, now let's see how to actually use those. So, you can actually, while you didn't have multiple inheritance, you do have the ability to add and combine multiple roles into your class, okay? Um, and if you have a case where multiple inheritance is actually useful, I would love to hear it. I've not, I, I've seen good examples of it, but honestly, most of them can be rewritten as roles in a much saner way. Um, so. I localized this slide. I probably am totally screwing up the, uh, the currency formatting there, though, I'm pretty sure. Um, I think you guys use a comma, and then pluses, and, or dots in weird places. Um, so, uh, comparable, you'll remember, required the compare method. So we implement that here by saying amount, other amount using spaceship operator, because we know we're probably working with an int here, um, or rather a float. Um, and there we go, we have that. That means from there we get all those other methods um, available to, oops, going the wrong way, sorry. It means we get all these other methods uh, for free, which means also, oh, oops. Yeah, we also get the equality. So comparable also does equality, and that comes in too. So we get the equals to, we get the greater than, we get the less than, you, less than or equal to, I just, there wasn't room on the slide. Um, but you, be, you get all these other methods for it. And then we're also doing printables, so we've got the as string method there. So again, very straightforward. If you're familiar with Moose, this is very similar uh, to that. So now, some of the uh, more interesting sort of edge cases here. Um, this right here, misspelling. I don't know about you, but I'm a horrible speller, so I would do this all the time. But you know what? This is a compile time error now. Okay, so this is very similar to inside out objects, Abigail. Um, inside out objects would catch this for your compile, compile time. Moose, hash based objects, not so much. Now this will catch it. Um, additionally, classes are no longer packages, classes are classes. They're a completely separate thing, and they can be put within packages. Now again, not to bring back the Java too much, but Java, C Sharp, a lot of these other languages have, these idea, have this idea of both a class and then some sort of larger container, a namespace in C Sharp, Java has packages, um, uh, Python does this in their, in their packages as well, um, although I don't know how formalized that is really. Um, but the idea is, you know, now it's actually kind of okay to write a couple classes in the same file and put them into a package. 
Uh, you can certainly put them into separate packet or separate files if you want, but if it doesn't make sense, if your classes are small, you don't have to do that. Um, oh, uh, classes are sh have strict warnings on by default within their body, uh, but you still need to do that in packages. Although I think in 5.14 this is default anyway, so you don't really need to do it. Um, calling them, uh, calling a class from within a package, just like that, because it's just another. Uh, it's another first class element within that package, so it's really just that straightforward. One of the sort of nice benefits of all this is that we also get the scope of the package available within the class without polluting the class, which means that this package, this becomes basically class level uh, data, class level configuration data in this case, and this becomes essentially a, a, uh, a sort of a private utility subroutine that can be used within your class, but does not pollute your class's namespace, okay? So there's no more need for like namespace clean or any of those hacks that remove all the imported functions from your class namespace. They're just not there anymore. Um, and what is it, 518 or 520, Jesse, something? Okay, so, so Sprout is working on uh, making my sub work, which means you get truly private utility subs that only your classes need to care about or can care about and can fall within there and then you can use. This also works well with non-P5 mop classes. So this here is a small example of uh, basically using path class and using the file object for path class. Um, we use it down there. We know we've got a path class object. It's sort of all in there. That, that file uh, uh, subroutine is not part of our class namespace, but we can use it. Um, I also want to point out build. So this is the first time we've seen build. So if you're familiar with Moose, um, Moose has this thing called, or the, these, these uh, sort of special subroutines, or special methods uh, of capital build and capital demolish. Um, and build is basically run after an instance is created and is used to initialize it and it's run in uh, a very specific order from, um, to make sure that initialization happens in the correct order, running all the way up through your superclasses. Um, and then demolishes the opposite, goes in the other way, and it's triggered by destroy. Um, one nice thing about the P5 mop is that this is actually not within the dispatch space for the class, so you can never call data file arrow build. Okay, this becomes a private uh, constructor sort of initializer that's only for you and that uh, can't be called from outside, things like that. So if you need to do that, you just put it in a method. Um, but the idea is that the constructor and the destructor, de constructor and destructor are overridable in subclasses, but they're not part of the actual um, uh, method dispatch pass. Um, all right, so I'm running a little quick. Before I dump into the next section, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> okay, all right, all right. If, if there's enough time at the end, I'll do a live demo. Um, I don't know if I've got everything all set up, but. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, he said the IRC overlords demand a live demo. So. We'll try and do that towards the end. So. I didn't really get what's the difference between Moose code inheritance and uh, row. Is there any other relation that row involves? So uh, the way roles work is. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, he asked if there was. Uh, he didn't understand the differences between roles and multiple inheritance, and he wondered if there's any limitations to the roles method. Is that okay? Um, so uh, roles um, are actually composed into a class. So. If you give it a list, if you give uh, Moose or if you give the P5 mop a list of roles, what it'll do is it'll take all those roles and using a set of uh, sort of laid out and specific uh, composition rules, will combine all those roles together into a single role and then apply that role into your class, again using a set of strict composition rules. Um, what it does is it prevents uh, the diamond problem because the diamond problem that you, the traditional multiple inheritance diamond problem would would actually result in a conflict rather than um, uh, basically working and being semi-unpredictable. Um, so it's, it's sort of stricter, but it gives you the same ability. I, I like to call it horizontal reuse 
So uh, with, with inheritance, you're sort of going vertical, up and down, um, super sub, sub, all that. Uh, with roles, you're really taking code and you're sort of bringing it in from the side and you're mushing it into your class and you're essentially saying my class can do these behaviors. So if you think about how a lot of people use multiple inheritance and mix-ins and stuff like that, it usually comes back to adding behavior into a class rather than changing sort of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the taxonomy is the word, no, maybe not. Um, of, of, of sort of the, the you know, what, what you're structuring your class as. Does it make sense? Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes? You mean with, well, the, these things you use demolish to make sure that you can call it all along the inheritance hierarchy. Yeah, but this is called uh, automatically, right? Well, destroy, yes, destroy the underlying technology that we are running this on, which is a bit of sort of a hack because it's a prototype, um, hook into destroy in order to catch that. that uh, okay. So the question is, uh, if we used a real garbage collector rather than reference counting, um, would this be able to hook into that? Sure, why not? Patches welcome. I mean, <laughs> if we can get a real garbage collector into the core, yes, I would think that you know having having more controlled uh, destruction of of objects um, would only be helpful for that garbage collector. So, in theory, yeah, I think that would work. So. So uh, the question is basically, how does this relate to Moose, and will you still be able to use Moose, or will this replace Moose? Um, this won't replace Moose. Um, uh, you will still be able to use Moose. You'll still be able to use any Perl 5, uh, non-P5 MOP, Perl 5 classes with P5 MOP, where that's, that was sort of a design uh, uh, goal with Moose from the very beginning to make sure non-Moose classes worked well with Moose classes. Um, and so we're taking the same design goal here, because it's, it's important to preserve all the work we've done up until now and, and, and just the CPAN. I mean, that's why we, that's one of the big reasons why we're all here using Perl and why we're all here at this conference is CPAN. It's, you know, it's a giant toy chest. Um, so, uh, yes, you will be able to use Moose. Um, essentially, this will allow us to delete probably two thirds of Moose and implement the rest of it on top of there. Um, Moose tends to get very opinionated um, in certain places. The goal here is to keep this simple enough that we're not injecting as many opinions onto people um, and onto, onto uh, uh, the way people write code. So we're hoping sort of the extensions to this, one of which will be Moose whatever version um, on there. And then the idea too is that if we get a lot of the other accessibilities to use this and we're all using the same core, uh, there'll be a lot more interoperability between, you know, uh, Mojo Base that's written with this, or Class Accessor that's written with this, and a, and a Moose that's written with this, and so on and so forth. So we'll all be able to sort of uh, play well, play, play more easily together the different frameworks. Um. Yeah, you mean methods don't require invocants? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. So he's asking if, if he just wanted to clarify that um, methods require an invocant. Yes. Um, honestly, I hate that about Java. I hate that methods look like function calls within that class. I find that very distasteful. <laughs> and then all the Java programmers that ever see my code find that this dot that I put in front of everything very distasteful. So um, I like the invocant, but you didn't have to shift it off. So that's, that's one, one benefit there. So <laughs> can't fix everything. Uh, we don't have a way 
Yes, I mean, they're already there for you in, in the dispatch uh, path, but uh, we don't have a way to, like, like, like you can do now where you say uh, uppercase super double colon and then any arbitrary method to skip out of inheritance. No, we don't have a way to do that. I mean, you could do it through the mop if you really wanted to, but no, we don't provide a support for that. Yes, so uh, the question is, there's no, nobody, he, he has not seen lazy or default or anything like that, uh, you mean specifically sort of from Moose? Yeah. yeah. Um, again, those are kind of opinionated. Um, there will be a way to add those into here, just as um, uh, the accessors, uh, yeah, the, the sort of the is read write, like I said, that's not there, we've debated several times whether that should be a core feature or not. I think it probably should be a core feature. I think everybody's gonna expect it. Um, the reality is you need accessors less because uh, you, know, you're, you don't have to call methods within your classes, within, um, yeah, within the scope of your classes. So you sort of need them less, but it's probably gonna be there. Uh, everything else will just sort of get either added on through an extension um, uh, or something like that. But we, we wanna sort of avoid being too tricky and too opinionated in this so that other people can build their stuff on top of it. So. Please continue. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, so, uh, before I jump into the next slide, um, I wanna show this. So, um, uh, I peer pressured Jesse Lures into doing this um, in the last couple of days so that I could show this and potentially do a live demo. Um, this is basically, uh, so the same parameter parsing syntax that, that we have for methods, we just sort of swapped it over to also work with functions. Um, again, really, really, really simple. Not trying to get into fights, not trying to get into sort of bike shedding arguments on this, I just want signatures, that's it. Um, so uh, this is just sort of a nice example, using nice given when syntax, woohoo, all our functional programming friends can be jealous now. Um, it also does, I mentioned before, the Slurpee. So uh, we've got two scalars and an array. This works basically, all you have to do is think about taking that, moving it down one line, putting a my in front of it, and putting an equal at underscore after it. If, as long as you think of it to work just like that, that's exactly how it will work, okay? Simple, 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 simple. Um, yes? What do you mean? The case for the uh, for this? No, these are this, these these just make variables within the scope of that. Um, if we start to talk about name parameters versus positional parameters, it'll just go on and on and on and on. Everybody have an opinion. I'm, I'm again. I'm not forcing this down anybody's throat. It's a, it's an optional module, but I would really like to see just something simple. We can add on to it later, we can explore other options later, but let's just get this. I mean, just the, the carpal tunnel that this is gonna save several people already is, I think, worth it. So simplicity is sort of the goal with that. Um, so uh, here's another quick example. Uh, uh, again, just sort of using this um, and uh, using it with a P5 mop class. Um, so this is actually an example taken from something, a larger test that I was building in the test suite. Um, and it basically is a, trying to wrap uh, your base IO file and start to have actual exceptions. And so to convert things into actual exceptions. Um, using the fun stuff down there, we've got our checked parameters. Well, not checked, but uh, at least uh, already taken care of. Um, hopefully. When uh, that my sub hits, we'll be able to do the same thing with function. So you'll actually be able to get that uh, in there. And then, of course, real exceptions. Um, so this isn't necessarily part of any proposal, um, but as I was building this example, I thought, well, I like the throwable role that Ricardo Cygnus has up on CPAN. What would it look like in P5 mop? Um, and this is basically it. So Devel stack trace is still an old P5 module. I'm fluffing out the frame filter there because basically what I'm doing is I'm cleaning out some of the mop uh, prototype stack frames that are in there, but that's even used in, uh, in standard Devel stack trace as well. Um, but 
basically, so you've seen before equals and then a, a literal value, a 10, or in this up there, the error. Uh, you can also put in objects in here, um, and you can also put in other references in here. And what actually happens is that we trick the parser to actually wrap that into a subroutine, so that will get called. So that's actually the defaults right there um, that you were asking about earlier. Um, so this won't be just one instance created within the class scope. This will actually get created for each instance. So imagine an implicit subroutine wrapped around that to make that lazy. Um, and then one important thing to point out, you can't call arrow, or you can't call arrow throw, you have to call arrow throw new, which you saw in the previous slide. But essentially, um, and uh, also this, uh, essentially this is pretty much what the throwable role does uh, in, that's up on CPAN. Here we have it here, and it's functioning and working in the test. Um, so uh, one other quick thing, as string, uh, if we remember correctly, that fulfills the printable role. So we can add this in here. So now we actually have, we make our throwable with printable, okay? And so we know that it has an add string method, which allows us to do this. So you might notice no try tiny there. Um, again, we hacked up a prototype. It's on CPAN for now. Um, it uses try tiny in the background, but it basically creates a language level uh, try catch statement, okay? Also finally block in there. And look ma, no semicolon. It's a nice, it's, it's the little things really, it's the little things that make you happy. Um, but this also, uh, well actually this doesn't actually work yet, but uh, it's not too far from it. Uh, Ricardo Singus put out a, uh, a proposal for a fixed smart match um, out there, uh, which would make this work. And I think actually, can we make this work, Jesse? Just, yeah, it's a little hard. So, um, so when Rick finishes his stuff, uh, that'll work. In the meantime, you do have to do this. Um, but imagine, I mean, that's nice. Like I said, it's printable. Hey, cool, I can call as string. That's it. Um, yeah, I mean, you'd have to play with the way smart match works, and right now it's kind of insane. So. Uh, yeah, the, well, oh, the code, ref, the code ref is kind of a hack. Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> so again, uh, what do I got for time? Do I have time for a live demo? Oh, sorry, Sean, no live demo. Um, so all the code is up here, okay? Um, the roles is in a branch called roles uh, redux, because um, uh, we've had arguments about how roles should work. Um, so, uh, but it's all up there, it's all runnable. I encourage you to grab it, take a look at it, play with it, write some tests, please commit back if you want. Um, we are going to work on this. Uh, this is the Moving to Moose Hackathon um, that the Oslo PM guys have, woohoo, um, put on for us. And uh, next week, we're going to be sitting up in, I hope, much cooler, more, <laughs> 12 degrees, that's really cold for me actually, so, but I'm fine with that. Uh, uh, so up next week in Norway to do it, and if you're interested, um, I think we're gonna probably, I'd like to, solve it if you don't mind, I'd like to do most of the work on the new P6, P5 channel. Um, you know, we're gonna have a lot of the Pearl 6 hackers up there with us too, um, so I think there's a perfect opportunity to sort of start really getting that channel maybe, hopefully going with some stuff. Um, so if you're interested in playing with this, hacking, or even just being part of the discussion uh, up there in Norway, please go to this channel and blank slide. That's it.